Well, what do you think? I think we're eight o'clock. Okay, if we begin our asthma grand rounds, I want to welcome everybody uh, joining this morning to asthma grand rounds uh, and our exciting theme of can asthma be prevented? And I was thinking, I hope that the asthma grand rounds can revisit this topic every five years or so until there's a resounding definite yes as an answer. We had hoped to have uh, three presentations this morning, but uh, Dr. Wanda Fipitanical on Saturday has come down with a respiratory chest infection, has felt awful and is unable to uh, participate uh, this morning and we wish her a speedy recovery. But we have two exciting uh, presentations uh, coming on this the theme of primary prevention of asthma. And, um, it's my pleasure to introduce as our speakers, Dr. Kathy Lee Sarwar, who's a member of the Division of Allergy and Clinical Immunology at the Brigham, and Dr. Scott Weiss, who's a co-director of the Channing Division of Network Medicine and directs the Personalized Medicine Program for Mass General at Brigham. And we'll look at two or more exciting approaches to the primary prevention of asthma. I do want to mention, and I hope there are none, but if there are any technical problems you have signing in, just send a quick email to BWH webcast troubleshooting at partners.org and they will help quickly. And then just to remind you, we're now in a Zoom format. So if you have questions, you can submit them by chat or you can text them to me at 617-513-6043 and we'll uh, present them to our speakers at the end of the program. And then if you're interested in CME credit, just uh, email me your uh, name and include your degree and uh, send it to cfanta at partners.org. And I will happily forward it to Harvard uh, Medical School uh, for their uh, uh, awarding of the CME credit. So we begin then with uh, Dr. Lee Sawa uh, a presentation on asthma prevention. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be part of this panel trying to answer this very thought provoking question of can we prevent asthma? And just to confirm, can everyone see my slides? I assume yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is yeah. pretty, thank you, a big question. And given my area of research focus, instead of trying to tackle the whole thing, I'm going to instead try to address the question can we prevent asthma by modifying the microbiome? So I'll start with some bigger picture ideas and then get into some asthma preventive strategies targeting the microbiome that are currently in the pipeline. <clears throat> and I, I know I was, and I think all of us were really looking forward to Dr. Fipitanical's um, portion of this. So at the end, I, I want to touch on a couple of things that I think she may have been planning to talk about that I think are really exciting too. So part of the temptation to think that we should be able to prevent asthma is rooted in epidemiologic data showing that asthma used to be a rare disease and now has become quite common. In this plot, based on data from various worldwide cohort studies, you can see pediatric asthma there in the red dashed line emerging in the 1940s, peaking around 2009, and then actually starting to decline. And that pattern makes it tempting to say that something must have changed in the last several decades. So let's figure out what it is and then unchange it. And then we can be preventing asthma that way. But the problem is that there are a lot of things that have changed in the past several decades. When we look at environmental elements of the so-called meta-exposome, possible culprits include dietary changes, air pollution, climate change, microbial dysbiosis, and exposure to a vast array of environmental substances. It's been estimated that over 200,000 chemicals have been introduced to humans since the 1960s. And many of these exposome elements have not only epidemiologic, but functional and experimental evidence of being damaging in some way that's relevant to asthma. So not only is it difficult to prioritize which of these should be targeted most aggressively to prevent asthma, but it's very likely that some or all of them actually need to be targeted. That being said, my uh, personal area of research interest is in the microbiome, so I'm going to focus in my time with you today on the role of microbial dysbiosis. 
And when people think about the role of the microbiome in allergy and asthma, they frequently call the mind the hygiene hypothesis. Uh, and this concept has really rooted itself in the imagination, both of the public and the scientific community. The hygiene hypothesis posited that reduced microbial exposure is responsible for the increased prevalence of allergic disease. And it was proposed in a manuscript describing the observation that larger household size is associated with reduced hay fever. And that was really a concise report. I pasted that paper on this slide in its entirety, and it's now been cited over th uh, 3,500 times since it was published in 1989. In the 34 years since then, additional factors that are known to affect the microbiome have also been linked to reduced risk of asthma and allergies, including breastfeeding, living on a farm, owning a dog, birth by vaginal delivery, daycare, and absence of antibiotic treatment. But there are problems with the hygiene hypothesis in its original form. Uh, for one thing, it makes no claims about some microbial exposures being more beneficial than others. And that really flies in the face of a well-established literature showing that early life wheezing infections with rhinovirus and RSV are risk factors for asthma. It also doesn't square with the observation that improvements in hygiene like clean water and health mint eradication were complete before most of the major rise in allergic disease as has been pointed out by Dr. Thomas Platts Mills and co-authors in the citation referenced on this slide. Dr. Platts Mills et al. instead hypothesized that it was actually modern air conditioning and the closing of houses that re re resulted in a reduction in asthma since the year 2000 due to reduced exposure to pollens and dust mites. And in an interesting article appraising the evolution and persistence of the hygiene hypothesis that was published just a few months ago, the original author of the 1989 hygiene hypothesis paper himself stated that while the hygiene hypothesis led to a fundamental reappraisal of our relationship with our microbial environment, the underlying mechanism for variations in allergy prevalence with family size remains in Churchillian terms a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. So to accommodate the shortcomings of the original hygiene hypothesis, ideas around the role of the microbiome in human disease have really evolved to focus less on infections and more on the health benefits of having a diverse microbiota. Newer theories include the biodiversity hypothesis, old friends hypothesis, and biome depletion theory. And the plot on the right here shows that people from the United States do exhibit a reduced stool microbiome diversity compared to inhabitants of less westernized or industrialized communities. So now there's this dominant idea that with modernization and westernization, beneficial microbes have been lost from our collective microbiomes, and this has caused an increase in diseases, including asthma. There's even efforts to collect microbes from more remote parts of the world and try to store them in kind of a microbial Noah's Ark um, and potentially use them in the future in a therapeutic or preventive manner. Uh, so it's tempting to think that if microbiome changes are driving increases in asthma, maybe it's not so important to tease out exactly which environmental factors led to this, but instead we can just try to restore the microbiome towards its ancestral state, um, often referred to as rewilding. However, this really has to be approached with caution for several reasons. Uh, for one thing, there's the logistics of whether microbes that have been lost from our microbes would act from our microbiomes would actually find a niche and persist in our bodies today. And there are ethical issues around utilizing samples from non-industrialized populations, which has been criticized as a colonial endeavor. It's also an open question as to whether our ancestors or people in traditional communities are actually even healthier than we are now in the specific ways that we want to be healthier especially since life expectancy was much, much shorter for prior generations than now. And moreover, gut microbiomes in non-industrialized populations are optimized for um, the diet and lifestyle of the people who have those microbiomes. So they're optimized to maximize host energy gains in the setting of a diet that's high in difficult to digest fiber and a lifestyle that's high in physical activity features that might not be as desirable in people with more sedentary lifestyles and diets lower in fiber like many of us today. And the key point I'd like to make here is that even if you buy in 100% that modifying the microbiome is the way to prevent asthma, we're going to need, as Rachel Carmody has put it, a scalpel approach instead of a sledgehammer. 
So how to develop that scalpel, I think will probably require the type of process very familiar to people in this audience, integrating human epi epidemiologic evidence with bench experimental evidence to try to uncover and target the relevant mechanisms. And I don't have time to delve very deeply into the, the really rich literature that already exists in this area that could be pulled from. But just to hit on some of the highlights, in terms of data from birth cohort studies, we know that there are reproducible differences in the upper airway microbiome as early as one month of age between uh, infants who go on to have asthma and those who don't. Likewise, there are differences in the gut microbiome associated with subsequent asthma. And we have ample, although sometimes conflicting data on early life risk factors for asthma that might act at least in part through the microbiome the most compelling of which is probably the story showing that living on a farm is associated with reduced asthma risk. In terms of evidence from wet lab and mouse studies, we're learning more all the time about the types of biochemistry that's unfolding in all of our bodies, thanks to the metabolic machinery supplied by the human microbiota and how that affects immune function and disease risk. And while microbes can interact with the human host in, in several ways, microbial production of bioactive metabolites is thought to be um, one of the most important modes of host microbiome interaction. So here, these are just a few examples of high profile papers on a couple classes of microbial derived metabolites, including short chain fatty acids like butyrate, which I'll mention again later, uh, that have been found to pr promote T regulatory cell differentiation. These and other microbial metabolites um, have also been found to reduce experimental allergic airway inflammation in mouse models, and they're associated with asthma in humans. So these are um, certainly potentially good targets. So for the last bit of my time, um, I want to turn now to the topic of developing microbiome-directed strategies to prevent asthma. And this is really challenging. When I think about this topic, I often get this song by Dr. John stuck in my head, which I'm not going to sing to you, but the lyrics go, I've been in the wrong place, but I must have been the right time. I've been in the right place, but it must have been the wrong song. I've been in the right vein, but it seems like the wrong arm. So the point is that you could get a lot right, but then there are a lot of ways to just go slightly wrong and derail your preventive efforts in trying to prevent asthma by targeting the microbiome. Um, so choices include things like, should we be going after the airway microbiome, the gut microbiome, or the environment? Should we start the intervention during pregnancy, sometime in childhood, or are some of these things only effective after asthma is already developed? And what exactly do we want to target we can be as precise as specific probiotics or metabolites, or we can have a broader impact on the microbiome using consortia of bacteria, bacterial lysates, even fecal microbiota transplantation. And of course, asthma is a heterogeneous disease and different phenotypes and or endotypes will most likely have different responses to microbiome targeting interventions. So with those challenges in mind for um, the next, the, the rest, of my talk almost, I'll discuss some strategies currently under development. So to start with probiotics, which could theoretically replace missing beneficial microbes, at least if can, taken consistently, uh, there have been several quite heterogeneous studies of probiotics and allergic outcomes. Most meta-analyses show modest beneficial effects of some probiotics for eczema prevention, but no effect on asthma. Although a recent meta-analysis did suggest that one probiotic, Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, may reduce asthma occurrence. So the evidence is, is weak at this point, but I think probiotics could be a viable strategy in the future if we can figure out the best strain, dose, and timing of administration. And um, one promising study in this area was published in 2021 in Cell, where the authors observed in a cohort of human infants that presence of microbes in the gut that could utilize human milk oligosaccharides, which are present in human breast milk, have reduced inflammatory cytokines in their plasma. So those findings led to a trial in 60 exclusively breastfed infants of a bifidobacterium probiotic called EVC001, which actually expresses all of the human milk oligosaccharide utilization genes. And as you can see from the plots here, uh, before treatment, the infants in each group had similar stool cytokine profiles, but after the treatments, those who received the EVC001 had reductions in inflammatory cytokines. And um, as the author showed in other experiments, they also had a skewing away from a TH2 response. And there was a in vitro. 
And there was a lot more in that paper that I don't have time to cover, but hopefully we'll see more studies like this where the probiotic selection is a bit more rational and importantly with longer follow-up so we can see how this actually affects risk of diseases like asthma in these infants. And of note, I think the study also highlights that these treatments will need to be personalized as the EVC001 may really rely on the presence of breast milk in the diet to be effective. So if probiotics are not ready for prime time, you might wonder if we can go beyond the microbes and directly administer their beneficial metabolites. And this is another area of active investigation, including for butyrate, one of the short chain fatty acids I mentioned earlier uh, that's beneficial both in allergies, asthma, and a lot of other diseases actually. Um, and it's really quite challenging to supplement butyrate because orally administered short chain fatty acids are rapidly absorbed and metabolized. They don't really get to the gut where you want them to be. And butyrate is uh, kind of notorious for its really disgusting taste and smell. Um, recently, Kathy Nagler, Jeffrey Hubble and colleagues found a way to intragastrically deliver my cells that will release butyrate in different parts of the GI tract. Um, and you can modify where they get released based on the futures of the micelles. And in mouse models, this actually led to an increase in beneficial microbes and protected against peanut anaphylaxis and a colitis model as well. So I think that's really exciting. In humans, this is most likely be reformulated as an oral suspension or other oral formulation that masks the, the taste and smell of butyrate. Another thing you might wonder is whether instead, instead of trying to correct a suboptimal microbiome, we could just prevent the dysbiosis from occurring in the first place. And one way to potentially do that that's currently under investigation is the practice of vaginal seeding after cesarean section birth. This is based on observations that the infant microbiome does differ between those born by cesarean section and vaginal delivery. And there is epidemiologic evidence that these microbiome perturbations could be on the causal pathway towards childhood asthma. So vaginal seeding protocols can vary, but they generally involve incubating a sterile gauze in the vagina for a period of time before cesarean section. And then within minutes of birth, the baby is swapped with the gauze all over their body, starting with the mouth and the face. Uh, vaginal seeding has been shown to lead to a partial restoration of a microbiome similar to those borne by vaginal delivery. And there are currently several clinical trials underway of various forms of vaginal seeding with asthma outcomes, um, although I'm not aware of any results from those trials so far. For now, vaginal seeding remains controversial. Um, there are a couple of quotes here on this slide. One is kind of pro-vaginal seeding. Rob Knight is a microbiome expert who has publicly disclosed that he um, that his own child uh, had this vaginal seeding treatment after being born by cesarean section. And then there's kind of a dissenting viewpoint there from Adam Gratner um, from NYU. And it's not currently approved by ACOG. And I think we, we will have to wait and see what the data from clin clinical trials show regarding both safety and efficacy of this. So we talked about going after the microbes, the microbial derived metabolites, and the host level risk factors for dysbiosis. And this, um, this slide zooms out even a little bit more to discuss whether we could modify or engineer the environmental microbiome to, to prevent asthma, based uh, primarily on observations such as the much reduced incidence of asthma among people who grew up on farms. And there are limited data in this area, but here we have a study from Finland of daycares where the play areas were modified by adding four spore samples in sod, and those daycares were compared to unmodified daycares. You can see from the plot on this slide, the soil microbiome in the intervention daycares did come to resemble the intervention materials, the soil and sod. And this actually did translate to some differences in the skin, saliva, and gut microbiomes of the children but there are no data yet on whether this leads to a difference in clinical outcomes. And there are other similar ideas, including the preparation of rugs that can, are packed with a layer of microbe rich soil that could be placed in entryways of urban homes. And this is under development by investigators at the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare. So before I conclude, I wanna just briefly touch on a couple of other topics that I suspect Dr. Pipitanical might've mentioned. And this one actually fits in pretty nicely with my talk, although instead of relating um, 
instead of relating to trying to restore a commensal microbial community, this is more about using microbes to directly stimulate an immune response that could skew away from Th2 inflammation, uh, also known as innate immune training. <clears throat> so bacterial lysates are cellular extracts from dead microbes um, and results from a clinical trial of one such treatment with bacterial lysates, MV130, were recently published, um, and the goal here was to modify the natural history of asthma and prevent wheeze in children who've wheezed in the past. So MV-130 is a sublingual suspension of heat-inactivated whole cell bacteria, including the bugs listed on this slide. And the trial randomized 120 children under age three who'd had at least three wheezing attacks in the prior year. Those who were randomized to six months of daily MV-130 had an average of three wheezing episodes in the year after the first dose, compared to an average of five episodes in those who received placebo. And the treatment also reduced the duration and severity of wheezing episodes. So those findings are shown in the plots on this slide, with the three plots on the left showing a reduction in the MV-130 group in the number of, uh, of wheezing attacks, the days with wheezing attacks, and the duration. And the survival plots on the right show an increase in the MV-130 group in the time until first wheezing attack, both, both in the first six months where subjects were on the intervention, as well as the following six months after the intervention. And reassuringly, there were no significant safety concerns reported in this trial. Um, going back to the point that we'll probably need to take asthma heterogeneity into account when selecting subjects for microbiome-directed treatments, uh, I think it's very worth noting that all the children in, in this study were non-atopic. So everyone got skin tested at enrollment. And if uh, you had a positive skin test, you could not be in this trial. So the findings don't necessarily apply to our children that we see with a more atopic wheezing phenotype. Um, and then there's another bacterial lysate formulation called OM85BV. This contains extracts from the five species listed on this slide. It's actually been in much more widespread use than MV130, popular in Europe and South America, and it has been for decades for respiratory tract infection prevention, with, with some evidence supporting its use for that indication. And there was this small randomized controlled trial published in Jackie back in 2010 of 75 children with recurrent wheeze finding that giving OM85BV daily for 10-day courses every month did lead to a reduction in frequency and duration of wheeze. And the effectiveness of this agent, OM85BV, in preventing severe wheezing, lower respiratory tract infection, and high-risk infants is currently under study in a multi-center randomized clinical trial called Orbex, led by Dr. Fernando Martinez and Dr. Fipitanical is also an investigator on that trial. So I don't have all the details that Dr. Fipitanical might have shared with us, but Results of that trial, I think, will really be something to look out for in the next few years. And finally, I know we're going to hear from Dr. Weiss about the role of nutrients and vitamin D in asthma prevention, and I've really focused on the microbiome, but I do want to at least mention some of these other ways to possibly prevent asthma. Um, there are strategies involving avoidance of allergic sensitization and allergen immunotherapy, which are promising, but uh, perhaps difficult to implement on a large scale. And of course, now we have this growing choice of biologics and small molecules for use in treatment of asthma and allergies. And I, I think it's really an exciting question of whether these could be used to prevent asthma or modify its natural history. Uh, and again, Dr. Fipitanical is in the lead in this area. She's running the PARC trial, which will look at whether we could give, uh, whether uh, omalizumab given for two years to high-risk preschool preschoolers could prevent asthma. Um, this is one slide that I, I think she was planning to show today about this study called the PARC trial. Um, involves enrolling 200 allergic wheezing toddlers, two to three years of age, who are high risk of asthma, giving them either anti-IgE or placebo for two years, and then observing them for two years after for these outcomes. So something else exciting to look out for. So now I will try to actually answer the question, can we prevent asthma by modifying the microbiome? And my answer is maybe. I think it's really promising. I hope we'll find out the answer is yes in the next several years, but I think we will find out the answer one way or another relatively soon. So with that, I will stop talking and turn it over to Scott.
Okay, can everybody see my slides? Perfect. And can everybody hear me? Yes, Scott, thank you. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, thanks uh, uh, to Chris for being here, uh, for, for inviting us. And um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. I gave this talk to, since the same talk to the Longwood uh, um, a a Asthma Research Group as a, as a warm up for this, but uh, um, We'll 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 see how this goes here. Um, I, I I don't have any significant disclosures. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, the first point I want to make is is that <clears throat> you, you know asthma as a disease ha has two components: a, a a structural component where there's abnormalities in the lung that are featured on the left hand part of this slide. And then an immunologic component where there's abnormal uh, inflammatory response. And so any treatment uh, or, or preventative that we come up with is going to have to address both of these uh, uh, components of the disease. The second point I want to make <clears throat> is that asthma is really disease of very, very early childhood. Uh, in this famous paper, uh, the allergist John Yeniger at the Mayo Clinic uh, was diagnosing the bulk of his asthma patients before the age of three, and in fact, most of them before the age of one. Now, that's an experienced allergist, but the, the phenotype manifests itself very early in life. And it's been my contention all along that if you want to prevent this disease, you're going to have to uh, uh, um, give something to pregnant women to uh, uh, actually change uh, fetal lung development. The, the, other, the other point that probably is worth making here is, is that the single most important <clears throat> uh, epidemiologic risk factor for childhood asthma is prematurity. Uh, uh, there, there, there are probably 50 studies now showing that the more premature the, uh, uh, um, the baby is, the more likely they are to get asthma. So <clears throat> the interest in vitamin D started in uh, my lab in 2004, when Benji uh, uh, was doing uh, uh, his K and identified the vitamin D locus as a risk factor for asthma. But instead of starting to investigate this from a molecular perspective, we said, well, <clears throat> let's see if we can show in epidemiologic studies that vitamin D intake uh, um, in the diet, mostly from supplements in mothers, was linked to asthma wheeze outcomes in children's in children. And we did two studies, one which was led by Gus Latunma, which was a, a study in Scotland. And the other was led by Carlos in the, uh, um, a, a study here in Boston. And it, both of these studies were, it covered a range of dietary intake of vitamin D from about 200 milligrams up to about uh, uh, 3,000. And when it's interesting, when you did a quintile analysis and compared the top quintile to the lowest quintile, <clears throat> you saw that there was about a 50% reduction in asthma wheeze and the offspring uh, uh, of mothers who took the higher vitamin D. And that, that, that seemed to be consistent over a very wide range of, of intakes. Now, the other important point is this last bullet here with you know, vitamin D mediates all aspects of pregnancy and postnatal immune function, everything from implantation to, uh, uh, to the gut microbiome and innate and primarily innate, but also adaptive immunity uh, during the first years of life. So the, the issue of what time to actually do an intervention in pregnant women is, is, is a critical issue. Uh, <clears throat> probably half of all uh, <clears throat> um, miscarriages could be prevented if uh, pregnant women were taking higher doses of vitamin D um, so we, we designed uh, uh, the, the, the VDAR trial, uh, um, and we, we made some compromises to uh, uh, deal with this as best we could. We enrolled women between 10 and 18 weeks of pregnancy, uh, randomized them to 4,400 IU of vitamin D in the treatment arm, 400 IU in the control arm, monitored them, them monthly with questionnaires, had blood draws at the beginning, of the study at entry and at 32 to 38 weeks, a cord blood uh, a blood draw uh, um, <clears throat> looked at pregnancy and birth outcomes and potential complications, followed the mothers with questionnaires uh, and the baby with questionnaires up, up to age uh, uh, um, six and now actually up to age 11. Now, the first result of the study was that we undershot with the dose. Uh, um, 
the the uh, um, <clears throat> IOM recommended level of vitamin D is 20 nanograms per ml. The Endocrine Society recommended level of vitamin D is 30 nanograms per ml. And you can see here that <clears throat> with the 4,400 IU, uh, we, we only reached the uh, uh, um, Endocrine Society level of sufficiency in 75% of the subjects. Uh, obviously, there was an effect of the higher dose compared to the lower dose, uh, um, but 25% of the mothers did not reach our targeted level of uh, sufficiency in the trial. <clears throat> These are the results. This figure was taken directly from the JAMA paper in 2016 that showed the results uh, uh, at uh, three years. And you can see here in red is the uh, um, a time to event plot, a uh, proportion of uh, free, those free of asthma recurrent wheeze. Uh, in the red is the treatment group, in the green is the control group, and the p value was just barely not significant. But the reduction uh, um, doing this analysis was only 20%, so it wasn't even half of what we saw in the observational studies. So <clears throat> we went back and asked ourselves, some important questions. Uh, um, you know, the first was pretty clear we didn't give enough vitamin D. Only 75% of the trial participants achieved the level of 30, which was where we wanted them to get to. <laughs> we didn't give the vitamin D early enough in pregnancy. Uh, implantation, maintenance of a normal pregnancy in a variety of species, human, mice, rats, monkeys, and dogs, uh, uh, is dependent on vitamin D. Uh, and immediately upon conception, <laughs> the pregnant woman uh, uh, increases her production of the active form of vitamin D, the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, uh, increases ten, uh, uh, tenfold. Uh, um, we, and we know that the vitamin D influencing branching morphogenesis, which begins as early as the seventh week of, seventh week of pregnancy, and we weren't randomizing people to the uh, uh, tenth week of pregnancy. But the fundamental problem with nutrient trials. And this holds for the vital trial that was just published in the New England Journal. It, 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 and, and it's something that is completely ignored by high profile medical journals is that there's nutrient contamination of the control group. In a drug trial, the placebo group has no drug. But in a nutrient trial, there's vitamin D present in the, in the control group, and there's vitamin D present in the treatment group. There's just more vitamin D in the treatment group. To the, so to the extent that there's vitamin D sufficiency in the control group, you're creating a null bias and reducing your power. And so one of the questions we asked ourselves, well, we, we can't do anything about bullet point number one and two, but we could do something about this. We could do another analysis. Uh, uh, um, and, and that's what we did in, in, in these two papers. Um, so, so the first, let me, let me take you through this. The upper left-hand panel in blue uh, is uh, 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 the individual effect estimates for both the COPSAC study and the VDART study, uh, <clears throat> uh, um, it, it adjusting for the initial le level of, of vitamin D in these trials. And we did both a fixed effect and a random, a random effect meta-analysis. Uh, uh, at the top in black is the individual study uh, odds ratios. At the bottom is the meta-analysis odds ratios. And now you see that we've eliminated the problem that was there in the JAMA study. These are significant, uh, statistically significant, uh, at a P of 0.02. Uh, um, <clears throat> and we have about a 25% reduction. But then when we went on, and analyze the trial results as a function of whether the vitamin D level was over 30. So, so in, in the blue, there's no adjustment for the initial level, but in, in the red and the green, there's an adjustment for the initial level. And when we do the adju adjustment for initial level, and by the way, th this is uh, uh, um, still an intent to treat a meta-analysis. So it's not, it, it's a, it follows the exact form of, you know, we're looking at the treatment group versus the control group. We're just adjusting for the amount of drug that's present in the control group. But now what you see in red at the top 
is that we recover almost uh, the identical uh, uh, amount of reduction in asthma recurrent wheeze, wheeze at age three years that you see <clears throat> that, that we saw in the observational studies. So this was very, very strong evidence to us that our trial was actually successful, that re really what was being shown here is, is that about a 50% reduction in asthma wheeze as a result of giving 4,400 IU of vitamin D to pregnant women. Um, so we went on and we looked at the uh, uh, baseline vitamin D level in, uh, um, in the, um, the treatment group at entry into the trial. And we were, and we were able to show again that <clears throat> the vitamin D was very low at entry uh, uh, into the trial in the treatment group. We had a dramatic effect with about a 75% reduction in asthma we use at age six. Uh, this has not yet been published. It's uh, about to be published. And that there was a direct relationship between the gestational age of the fetus and the probability of asthma recurrent wheeze, de de demonstrating exactly what we suspected in the trial, which is that <clears throat> uh, uh, um, the earlier gestational age uh, 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 intervention occurs, uh, the, the greater the reduction. And you can see in blue on, uh, uh, <clears throat> on the left, uh, uh, this effect in the treatment group and no effect uh, uh, in, in the control group uh, in uh, um, red on the right. And finally, uh, we showed both for airway res resistance on the left, we have airways resistance with lower airway resistance in blue at age four, five, and six years, and FEV1 uh, uh, at, at age six, hi higher uh, lung function as a function of the initial uh, 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 um, and third trimester vitamin D levels, uh, that the greatest effect was in the group that had the uh, um, vitamin D over 30. So to summarize, uh, pregnancy is a continuum. Vitamin D is necessary at every stage of pregnancy and beyond. Vitamin D sufficiency early in pregnancy has a greater effect on asthma outcomes than later in pregnancy. Nutrient trials are fundamentally different from drug trials because there is contamination of the control group, which... Uh, uh, um, at least to reduce power and intent to treat analyses suggest the congruence between the observational and clinical trial results if the initial level of vitamin D is accounted for. <laughs> so the effects of vitamin D are significant for asthma we use at three and six years, but for asthma and for lung function at age six when the baseline level is accounted for. So where, where do we stand with this? You, you know, you've got two papers, one published in JAMA at three years, and one published in the New England Journal at six years that don't adjust for initial or baseline level. Um, I, I could make some comments about, you know, the established literature and, and, and how we're all sort of dependent on uh, uh, how we receive medical information, whether it's information about whether the COVID virus escaped from the Wuhan lab or uh, whether there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And sometimes the established press lets us down uh, uh, with regard to, uh, uh, to this. 70% of all pregnant women uh, have vitamin D levels less than 30. This is a, a, a massive health equity issue, uh, African-American and black women have much lower vitamin D levels and have much higher complications that are linked to uh, a vitamin D deficiency, preeclampsia, preterm birth, and uh, asthma weeds in their off offspring. <clears throat> the U.S. Dietary Association recommends 600 IU of vitamin D during pregnancy, where you could see from our dosing, that wouldn't get you very far. Uh, uh, we use 400, but uh, uh, 600 isn't much better. Uh, the IOM recommend, uh, uh, <clears throat> recommends a serum level of 20, which may be okay for bone health, but it's not going to be enough for uh, uh, um, your immune health. And the Endocrine Society re recommends a serum level of 30 nanograms per ml and a dose in pregnancy of up to 4,000 IU, which, which we used in our study, but may, may, may be inadequate. Uh, the Cochrane Collaboration um, recommends further studies. Their meta-analyses uh, do not account for baseline level. 
and most academic OB programs, including Brigham and Women's Hospital, do not recommend vitamin D supplementation uh, during pregnancy. So uh, uh, why don't I stop there and we can have a discussion. Well, thank you very much, Scott and Kathy, and uh, uh, very exciting research and uh, ho hope for the future. Uh, can I ask you, Scott, just in uh, follow up, um, you, you mentioned the many effects of uh, uh, vitamin D uh, in the developing fetus, in, in particular, lung, its influence on lung development and as an immune modulator. And if you had to put your money, do you think the beneficial effect that you saw in reducing asthma prevalence had to do with lung development and bigger? No, I think it's I think it's absolutely both, Chris. I, I think that uh, yeah, you know, I, I, as a longtime clinician, I, I'm sure one of the things that you've noticed about your asthma patients is is that they're unusually sensitive to environmental stimuli that a non-asthmatic patient doesn't respond to, and that increased sensitivity to environmental and this is why uh, 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 um, decreasing allergens is never going to work for asthma prevention. Uh, uh, um, th that heightened sensitivity is a fundamental defect in their immune system, uh, uh, and and this is why <clears throat> vitamin D is linked to uh, cancer prevention, long-term health. Uh, uh, um, a, a, a lot of other things, but the structural changes in the lung can only happen if the vitamin D is given during pregnancy. That, that's the, if you don't give it during pregnancy, you, you will end up with permanent structural uh, uh, damage to the lung that, 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 that can't be changed postnatally. I, I think it's important to recognize that vitamin D is linked very directly to uh, the types of interventions that Kathy was talking about too here, you know, that, that, that a lot of the effects of the uh, um, gut, gut microbiome. And, and again, I, 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 I'm not holding vitamin D out as something that's going to prevent all asthma. It can't prevent all asthma. You could see from the data from the trial that we're talking about preventing 50% of asthma. But I think that there's a definite link to uh, uh, <clears throat> a, a, a lot of the way that the immune system functions and the gut microbiome is a critical feature of that. And so the vitamin D is linked to bile acids, the bile acid circulation, uh, uh, the production of specific bacteria, including lactobacillus and some uh, uh, bacteria in breast milk. Uh, uh, um, so uh, there, there are potential definite links between vitamin D and, 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 and uh, the gut microbiome as well. Your, your points about the, the timing make me want to ask Kathy um, if you could modify, and you'll have to unmute yourself, Kathy, the, 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 if you could modify the microbiome in such a way that it protected against the development of that. At what age do you guess that you would have to intervene to make a change? Uh, it sounds like earlier is better. Yeah, I would guess earlier is better. The epidemiologic data from birth cohort studies often find if you look for gut microbiome changes in association with subsequent asthma, um, many of the studies find that you can see them at three to six months or in the first, they, the earliest time points you sampled, but then they often disappear by age one year. And in the VDAR cohort, we did collect multiple st stool samples, including during pregnancy. And recently did an analysis kind of looking at different sample collection time points. And I was surprised to see that there was a pretty robust association with the maternal microbiome and subsequent asthma. And I think that's really an understudied area to date that it may be another area where we, it needs to, pregnancy is really the key target time point for the microbiome as well as these nutritional factors. Help me remember, Kathy, I thought there had been studies about the prevalence of asthma in children born by C-section versus vaginal delivery and not finding a big difference. Do I remember correctly? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. And that was actually true in the VDART study as well. And it's, I think, really tricky to tease out. This is the case for breastfeeding as well and something that I've thought about a lot because these are both risk factors that are not just it's not just one mechanism, 
one biologic mechanism within the body that you're perturbing, there are so many factors that change if you're born by vaginal delivery or C-section. There are so many different things in breast milk. It's There's microbes, there's prostaglandins, there's these immunoglobulins. There's so many things in there. And for both of those risk factors, I think I suspect that there are certain components of them that could actually predispose to asthma risk and others that would protect against asthma risk. So it's this kind of scalpel versus sledgehammer thing again. Um, but there are a couple studies, including an analysis we did in VDART, some analyses from COPSAC that kind of try to um, tease apart those risk factors for mode of delivery and try to look specifically what is the microbiome signature of mode of delivery and if we can kind of isolate that from all the other effects of motor delivery, then it seems like you see a stronger association between that microbial signature of cesarean section with asthma. So that's why, even though you're right, it's been um, heterogeneous, the overall association between mode of delivery and asthma, and same thing with breastfeeding, um, I still think that it could be worthwhile to go after the microbiome modifying effects of those exposures. And we focused on the prevention of uh, asthma. Do you want to comment whether uh, adequate vitamin D intake in pregnancy or modification of microbiome might at the same time have an influence on the food allergy, seasonal allergic rhinitis, and eczema? Yeah, you have to unmute. I'm so sorry. As Kathy showed that curve from the Tom Platts Mills paper of the <laughs> rise in asthma in instance that began in, in 1946, one of the most important things that happened in 1946 after the Second World War uh, uh, is that the U.S. Dietary Agency and physicians decided that for bone health, you pregnant women didn't need to take uh, uh, two tablespoons of cod liver oil. And it, it, that when you stop the cod liver oil, then <clears throat> uh, um, the, the uh, 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 television became available in the 1950s. Then uh, uh, um, people got air conditioning. It, it's not that what Tom Platts Mills has got it wrong. It's not that it, it, it is that people are indoors more and they're not getting any sun exposure. But, uh, but but it's not just being indoors. It's the, the fact that there's no vitamin D if you're indoors 95% of the time. And yes, absolutely. There is an effect of vitamin D for food allergy, for uh, uh, um, other autoimmune diseases uh, um, that, that is definitely there. Uh, um, it, it's, it's probably stronger for asthma than it is for uh, uh, um, th these other uh, rhinitis uh, 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 and food allergy, but but def definitely there for these other ones as well. Yeah, and I agree for the microbiome. Um, there are huge areas of research for both food allergy and eczema. For eczema, there's, of course, the role of staph aureus and other skin resident microbes and the possibility of bacteriotherapy, bacteriotherapy applied topically to the skin. I'm not um, an expert in that area, but I think it's really exciting. And then for food allergy, of course, the gut microbiome is kind of more proximal to the site of sensitization. So it's a, an easier, um, intuitive connection to make and really interesting mouse studies showing that if you transfer, um, the, the fecal microbiota from allergic infants to mice, for, again, from Kathy Nagor's group, and others have shown similar things that if you transfer the fecal microbiota to a germ-free mouse from a human that's allergic to cow's milk versus not allergic, you, you can actually transfer that phenotype to the mouse. So it does mm -hmm. seem to be, um, at least in part, a microbiota dependent process. And uh, now there are clinical trials underway of fecal microbiota transplantation for peanut allergy in adults. Um, again, kind of like the sledgehammer approach, but some data from from those trials at Boston Children's um, run by Reem and Rashid look really interesting. And then there's of course, less sledgehammer, more precise microbiota directed therapies for potential food allergy prevention or treatment also in, under development. So I think that's also really exciting. Back to sledgehammer uh, approach, I'm, uh, uh, 
uh, aware that we think of uh, asthma and allergic response as type two inflammation, and that there's this sort of yin yang between type one uh, uh, inflammation and type two uh, inflammation. And is there any chance that you have concerns that as we successfully suppress the development of allergic diseases, uh, that we might see a rise of uh, other autoimmune inflammatory diseases that are type one mediated? Well, I think that uh, if you talk about um... The biologics, I, I, I think there is a potential for something like that. I, I, I think with something like <clears throat> vitamin D, which is a natural immune modulator, I think the risks are uh, uh, pretty min minimal of that. Yeah, I haven't seen anything suggested a signal like that for microbiome. And I, I think that also goes to show just what a long way we have to go in terms of figuring out the precise mechanisms we're targeting with microbiome, because as of now, people kind of lump together all the inflammatory diseases and say, microbiome has something to do with this, we should target this. So I think that that should be a concern to keep in mind in the future, but not one I've seen so far in terms of the microbiome-directed treatments. Kathy, am I right? We've focused our discussion on gut microbiome. If you had to pick what you wanted to modify, if you could, respiratory microbiome versus gut microbiome, do you think the action is in the gut? For asthma, um, there, in terms of specific taxa, the findings are, the associations are, are seem much more reproducible in the airway. So that may be a more um, viable target for asthma, but I think that's a, a difficult question. I don't think I, there's enough data to know exactly at this point. And maybe we'll uh, end with one a policy question that was submitted, and it's uh, directed at you, Scott, as sort of uh, an advocacy. You had mentioned the health disparity issue that uh, vitamin D deficiency uh, uh, raises, and how, how do we proceed to mitigate this disparity or to advocate to uh, OBGYN to relook at the importance of vitamin D? Yeah, well, I'm struggling with that question right now, Chris. I, 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 you know, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. I, I, I only know that there are two OB departments in the United States. One is at the University of South Carolina and one is at Rochester, where Gus is, that are currently giving all pregnant women uh, um, high-dose vitamin D as soon as they come in for their initial prenatal visit. Uh, and, 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 and the... University of South Carolina has a huge African American population uh, that they serve, uh, um, but but I I agree. I mean I think it's a it's a tragedy uh, that that this is such a easy, simple, cheap fix uh, that that uh, 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 could uh, mitigate a lot of health disparities, not just for asthma wheezing, but also for preterm birth and preeclampsia. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, how to, how to go about getting the policy people interested in this? I, I, I don't know. I think it's, it's particularly difficult for me because, you know, I have two papers that are in impact factor 50 journals, and I'm saying based on an impact factor <clears throat> five journal that the, 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 the results are wrong. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, it, it took me a while to figure out what the problem was. But uh, um, so I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that. I wish I was better at the policy stuff. Well, I do look forward to uh, revisiting this topic. Uh, uh, in when you life. revisit it, you ought to uh, uh, add uh, uh, um, the omega-3 fatty acids and the vitamin A to this because, you, you know, the cod liver oil is... Uh, uh, vitamin D, vitamin A, and omega-3 fatty acids. I focused on the vitamin D because that's the greatest vitamin deficiency. The, 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 uh, there is no vitamin A deficiency in pregnant women. Uh, um, but uh, the, the uh, Biscard and the group in Copenhagen 
did the omega-3 fatty acids. Now, this is an interesting fact. What they did was they did a two by two factorial design. So they did <laughs> in a vitamin D in one group, uh, 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 omega-3 in the other group, the combination of vitamin D and omega-3 in the, in the third group and a, a control group. But when Jeff had them publish the paper, they disregarded the two, two by two factorial design. And they only published it as a, an omega-3 trial. And I think that in my reanalysis of that, those data, I think the effect is really driven by the vitamin D, not the omega-3. But that's uh, 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 un unpublished work. But I still think it's worth discussing in the context of uh, 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 prevention. And, and the other issue, which I think is a huge topic, is secondary prevention, uh, whether it's for COVID or there's a fascinating COVID paper that suggests that uh, um, sunlight has an independent effect of vitamin D in preventing COVID mortality. And, and I believe that that is true, that there are immune effects of taking vitamin D in through the skin that are beneficial, that are not, not there when you uh, uh, take it by mouth. But I'm not sure you could ever get the dermatologist to let you expose people to that much uh, uh, um, sun exposure. Well, again, uh, uh, thank you both very much for terrific presentations. Uh, let me see, what are you doing in 2026? I will, well, I'll follow up with you all. If, I, we'll if, I'm, still, if, I, if I'm still we'll alive, I'm back. happy to come back. All right, be well. Thank Thanks you. So Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, terrific, Chris. terrific presentation. See ya. Bye.